very nice. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Of course, I would like to begin also congratulating for the opening of the Center for Quantum Engineering, and we hope to collaborate with you in the future um, and consolidate existing collaborations. Today I will not talk about my research in Turku or my main line of research, but about something I'm very passionate about, and this is bridging the gap between academia and society. Uh, and I will highlight what I think are three main paths um, that should be undertaken um, to bridge the gap between academia and society. And my talk is structured accordingly in three parts. Uh, and I will focus specifically on quantum technologies and on an European perspective. So the first part is commercialization. We have been discussing about this already a lot, the route to the market and the way out of the lab. The second is science and society, reinventing scientific discovery. And the third one is education in a very broad sense in quantum technologies, reinventing scientific explanations. And I will describe this better during the talk. So quantum engineering and quantum technologies, what for? We have already um, heard about some of the applications that Colin discussed, and in particular about health and medicine. And in, I, I can just make one more example in terms of quantum simulations of complicated molecular structures that could be used to develop new drugs and also possibilities for developing new diagnostic tools. About security, we will hear in the next talk about already existing commercial uh, quantum um, key distribution devices that help improving security. About energy, well, we hope to be able to contribute uh, via room temperature superconductivity, but certain, certainly also in terms of new materials for new batteries and for new solar technologies. But most of all, well, I think that the most uh, straightforward application is high-performance computing. And this is big business in, in, in Europe. I'm focusing on Europe here. Uh, in 2001, it was uh, estimated that the uh, corresponding budget is about 8, million euros, uh, 8 billion euros in the world, in the world Europe. And I must say that we do know that uh, academically, scientific research in quantum technologies is at the forefront uh, in, in Europe, but we do lack and we are really lagging behind when it comes to patenting. And I think that here, the Center for Quantum uh, Engineering uh, in Alto is an exception, really, because you are an example of, of, of connection between excellent academic research uh, and um, small and medium-sized enterprises and creation of commercial opportunities. Uh, just to make an example, a comparison, in the period 2009-2011, if we compare patents for quantum technologies, China has patented five times more than the EU. So, of course, there are uh, challenges, uh, and one of the challenges is related really uh, to a way to translate European academic excellence in quantum technologies into market opportunities. And I believe that probably one of the uh, problems that has been highlighted already is the fact that there exists a gap between very complex laboratory setup and hands-off industrial instruments. And this very often prevents large investments from big companies into quantum technologies. So, I believe that actually the academia alone or even small and medium-sized enterprises alone cannot face this problem. Uh, and uh, however, in some, in some directions, uh, something is, is moving. For example, uh, in the UK, uh, 270 million pounds have been invested to accelerate uh, the commercialization of quantum technologies. And this is perhaps the, the broadest um, initiative in this field from the, um, in, in, undertaken from a single country, and we hope to see this more at the level of individual countries, but also uh, at the level of the European uh, Union. Uh, in particular, in the um, seventh uh, European Innovation Summit uh, in November 2014, a number of people from the academic community discussed uh, how Europe should react and should invest in quantum technologies. And of course, the proposals were large-scale EU-wide effort, like, for example, flagships, but also creations of advisory boards for quantum technologies with at least 50% representation from IT industry. Um, uh, now, I believe that, of course, commercialization is a very important key to bridge the gap, 
But I believe that at the same time, there are other routes to explore to involve society. Uh, and I'm going to discuss about one of them. Uh, I, I stole the time of uh, reinventing discovery from a book uh, from Michael Nielsen. Uh, Michael Nielsen is one of the leading scientists in quantum uh, information theory, uh, and he has also written this book on re reinventing discovery, where he talks about using the potential of online tools and the internet for citizen science, so to involve a broader audience in making science. This is a way of amplifying collective intelligence through online tools. Uh, and uh, I will say one story that comes to mind, I think it's quite interesting. This is the story of Tim Gowers, who is a mathematician uh, from Cambridge and a field medalist. You know, the field medal is like the Nobel Prize for mathematics. Uh, in 2009, Tim Gowers um, started an interesting social experiment. He picked out um, a difficult, unsolved problem in mathematics and he posted on his blog and he asked people to help him to solve it by posting comments on his blog. And uh, this is the Polymath project. The Polymath project started very slowly. Um, after seven hours, nobody had posted anything. Then um, a mathematician from British, from British Columbia posted a variant of the problem. 15 minutes after, a math teacher from Arizona responded. Then Terence Tao, another field medalist, again continues the discussion. And in 37 days, 27 people had posted 800 comments. Not only they had solved the original problem, but they had solved a more general problem of which the original problem was just a special case. And Tim Gowers described uh, this process as being to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. Another example I want to give is outside uh, physics, but it's again related to collective, uh, uh, amplifying collective in intelligence using internet. And this is an example that I think probably all of you know, Kasparov against the world. <laughs> in 1999, uh, Kasparov uh, played the game chess against the rest of the world. 50,000 people in 75 countries participated. The rest of the world chose the move by majority voting. And what happened is that finally, eventually, Kasparov won after 62 moves, but he claims that this has been the most challenging game he has ever played. And he commented saying that it is the greatest game in the history of chess. Collecting involvement. Another example I want to give uh, is Folded. This is a multiplayer online game about protein folding. So this is uh, a problem uh, that is connected to finding the lowest energy configuration of a complicated protein structure. Uh, and of course, uh, in 2010, in Nature, um, the team involved in this project acknowledging 57,000 folded players published this paper saying that actually the, through the game, the players were able to find the solutions to this problem better than the computer algorithm existing on the market. And I want to uh, stress one sentence um, from, from the paper. This is taken from the paper. The integration of human visual problem solving and strategy development capabilities with traditional computational algorithms through interactive multiplayer games is a powerful new approach to solving computationally limited scientific problems. The ground state of complicated molecular structure, structures like protein folding problem is a computationally hard problem. It's one of those problems for which we want to use our quantum computers because we can't do it with classical computers. Okay? And this is, this is one of the results that is to me most uh, interesting. This leads directly to the third part of, the, uh, of my brief presentation that is related to education and reinventing scientific explanation. Again, I stole the title from Michael Nielsen's uh, essay. And this has to do with the use of new digital media, not just for popularizing science, but as new tools to explain scientific ideas in a more effective way, not just for 
people who don't know anything about quantum physics, but also to experts using new media other than pen and paper. And this, this uh, lead me to the possibility of using games and video games for scientific discovery as well as for tools for teaching quantum physics and building intuition about quantum physics. QCraft is a variant of Minecraft that uses quantum rule developed by the Google's Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab team, and this is one of these examples. Uh, in Denmark, Science at Home is an initiative. This is a scienceathome.org, uh, is a website where you can play computer games for scientific discoveries, in particular in, quantum com in the quantum computer field. And this is led by uh, Jacob Scherson and Klaus Melmer from the University of Aarhus. We are doing research via uh, computer games. Uh, in our um, a small uh, environment in Turku, we teamed up with game professionals. We built a Games for Quantum project, and this is our address. And we started to work on similar ideas. In December 2014, we uh, started uh, to experiment with what are known as game jams. We organized the first quantum game jam. And we had three teams. Two of them were quantum. The first one was deja vu on factoring and period finding. This is connected to problems like quantum Shor algorithm. The second one was more related to explaining and building intuition on quantum physics. It was called quantum telepathy. Uh, and through this game jam, in two and a half days, we developed games like the Entanglement Hypermaze. This is related, it's a game that uses entanglement, uh, in, a simulation of entanglement, of course, to learn intuition about this phenomenon. Pi uh, Cycle is about quantum tunneling. They are all playable uh, in our website, so you can go there and play them. Of course, they are prototypes. At the moment, they are developed into full games. They've been developed in two, in two and a half days, so we, we need extra time to fully develop them into games. Quanstrument is not a game, but it's a Walker-based visualized pattern finder that we use to find a, a period of very long sequence of numbers. This is, again, related to factoring. And of course, we were in the planetarium, so we developed games for the planetarium. Inside the planetarium, there was a game that developed uh, to distinguish different types of multipartite entangled, uh, entanglement. 16 players uh, inside the planetarium with their mobile phones were interacting with the screen, performing measurements on the entangled particles just by clicking with their video camera. And everything was developed in these two and a half days. So we, we thought that game jams are a fantastic tool from, for brainstorming and bringing together communities. We had computer coders, we had game designers, game, uh, graphic designers, game developers, and of course quantum physicists all working together. And we were so excited that we decided to organize the first global quantum game jam. This will be in September um, 1820 in very different parts, very, many different cities around the world at the same time uh, will jam to build and brainstorm new games about quantum theory. Here in Helsinki, we are having our node, uh, and we are, um, uh, we are sponsored, and we are working in collaboration with Heureka, uh, where the game jam will be. And I want to conclude with crowdfunding science, another way of involving people into your research. This is one of the, uh, I think it's the most um, uh, well-known platform for uh, crowdfunding science is experiment.com. And this is an example of a, a small project. They are more or less all of this, the same order. It's about $2,000 what, what they were able to fund, uh, to, to obtain for this um, project with 43 uh, people, uh, backers, just people who just want to contribute to this type of projects. And now I would like uh, to show you the comparison with the similar projects for funding games. Okay, this is a very recent one, Exploding Kittens, February, uh, 20th of February 2015. This has been funded for 8 million 800,000 euros. It's not, almost 9 million dollars, sorry. Almost 9 million dollars for a card game, okay? $9 million for a card, this, compare it with the budget for the FET Proactive Quantum Simulation Initiative of Horizon 2020 is 10, is 10 million euros. I don't know, I think that the first uh, D-Wave computer was uh, $10 million, am I? It's actually 15. 
I, it, the first one, okay. I thought the, but fifteen million dollars. But I mean, this is this is unbelievable number to me, at least. So of course, the question is, can we tap into this potential? How about developing games for scientific research in quantum physics? This is not an exception. These are a number of other examples of games. These are video games, however. We are talking about five millions, four millions, and so on and so forth. Now, beside this sort of provocation, <laughs> the main message of my talk, and I'm concluding here, is that certainly the way to bridge the gap between society and academia passes through commercialization. It's one of the main ingredients, I believe. But at the same time, we need to create and develop new and powerful narratives that engage society, and that involve more and more people into science. And this can be done through new media and new tools for scientific explorations. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Sabrina. Comments or questions? Yes, Colin, please. Hi, that, that was great. I, I really like that. So um, I've got a, first a comment and yeah. then a question. So the, the um, comment was, we actually made a game, a D-Wave, um, called MaxCat. Max yeah. Cat. yeah. And it was a, a game to basically solve a puzzle in which yeah. the various cats... No, actually, I, I know. I'm aware of your game. Oh, yeah. It turns out that was the, the most soul-destroying game you could imagine playing. Soul you can, destroying. Soul yeah. destroying, you can never win. Right? Yeah. So, so part of the art of designing a good game is you have to have a way that the human can win sometimes, I think, right? Absolutely, so and that's not the only problem. Actually, there are, it is a very complicated problem because you have to balance between solving, say, a scientific problem and making the game fun. Right, That's the exactly. main point. Games, yeah. entertainment games, must yeah. be fun. That's why we are working in very close collaboration to game designers and game programmers. Because, and also, not only people start doing game studies and, and gamification are contributed to, because it is by no means an easy, an easy task. But potentially, I think that it could be very useful. Okay. And another way, I mean, it's not replacing a conventional research, it's a way to complement and explore new right. tools. And uh, just a comment that on Tim Gower's work, yeah. um, I think there's, there's a, a, a theoretical explanation for that. I don't know if you heard that there's a phenomenon which if you have a population of independent agents that have a normal distribution in skill performance, so most people are average and a few are really good and a few are really bad, if you turn on cooperation by exchanging hints, then systematically the distribution performance changes from normal to log normal. And Actually, the average performance goes down because people are wasting time communicating, but the proportion of high performers in the population goes up because the tail is enhanced. So it turns out that's fundamentally why it's good for societies to cooperate because you can boost the proportion of your high performance in society. Yeah, so I can send you some papers on that. That, that would be great. And, and of course, I mean, the whole idea is that of course, not replacing, but complementing and engaging more, engaging yeah, more yeah. people into research through these things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Sabrina. Thank you.